Hello, folks. Welcome to the Silicon Valley Health Institute. We've been, uh, in, we're a nonprofit, 501c, uh, in business about 20 years. We try to bring you the best in health experts to share this information so you can be proactive in your health or just because stuff is just extremely interesting. So feel free to join. Uh, you know, membership $60 a year, but these uh, videos are available to you anyway. And this week, we have Fred Provenza. I was really intrigued with his book. It was about animals' inner wisdom and that, you know, and comparing to human beings and how animals know instinctively what to eat unless you feed them an inappropriate diet. And the same for humans, just very interesting. So let me tell you a little bit about Fred. He uh, has spent seven years as a ranch manager with his wife, Sue, before earning his MS and PhD degrees in range science. He was a faculty member in the Department of Range Science from 1982 to 2009. He's currently Professor Emeritus in the Department of Wild Land Resources in Utah State University. For the last 30 years, his group has produced groundbreaking research that laid the foundations for what is now known as behavioral-based management of landscapes. That work inspired researchers in disciplines as diverse as chemical ecology, ruminant nutrition, human nutrition, and biopsychology, as well as animal welfare, landscape restoration, ecology, wildlife damage management, pasture and range land science, and management and rural sociology and eco-development. Along with his colleagues and graduate students, he has been the author and co-author of 250 publications in peer-reviewed journals and books, and he has been invited speaker in over 325 international meetings. This man is busy, so welcome. Thank you, Susan. <clears throat> I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be here with all you folks. The only thing could make it better is if we were actually in person, but that's not the way it is nowadays. Um, so let me give you a little bit of background. Um, that was a mouthful of all those things that you were saying, huh, Susan, about the different... We worked with a diverse array of people in a diverse array of fields, and I often thought, you know, it's been 45 years now of being involved in all of this. I've often thought back over the years um, about, you know, you can only focus on certain things as part of a research career, but you can read incredibly broadly. You can read about all different disciplines that you may never be able to work in or study in or experience. And nourishment was very much about that sort of thing. So let me, you know, trying to pull together ideas from diverse, diverse fields. And let me give you a little bit of background of what happened with the book. Susan, you mentioned that I um, retired 11 years ago from Utah State University. I'd worked there for 35 years. And my companion, Sue, my wife and I have 40, 49 years. We moved to the backwoods of Colorado. Um, and so I wrote Nourishment while we were living there in the peace and tranquility of nature. Um, I'm going to put some slides up for you just so it'll give you a little bit of a sense here of what, what, what I'm going to talk about and where, where I want to go. And let me back up just a second to here and say Steve and Susan and I are all agreed that we would like to make this interactive, not just a talking head, that the materials that I'll present, and I did this throughout my career, it was a way to have a conversation, not as some dogmatic kind of preaching or anything else. So that's the way I'd like to do this. Um, back to though the book and where this will lead us, um, you know, we, Sue and I were living in the uh, in the peace and tranquility of the backwoods of here's some shots of where we were living in the backwoods of Colorado. We were 12 miles in on graveled road. Um, you know, so it was a long ways just to get to where we lived. We were living alone and that wouldn't work for everyone, but for Sue and I, it was just perfect. And it was a wonderful time to, to reflect. Um, you know, when you're 
working in a career, as many of you, all of you may know, you're busy, you're the center of attention, lots of things are happening. But when you move to the backwoods, nobody knows you, nobody could care less who you are, what you've done, any of those things all fall away. And so that was wonderful time to reflect. And like our time here on earth, our time in the backwoods was a stolen moment. And we knew it. We used to tell each other that all the time. We were living at 9,500 feet elevation in the transition zone between the conifer and aspen woodlands and the expansive grass and forb dominated parklands of what's known as South Park. Um, we were surrounded by 14,000 foot granite peaks. During the day, we were immersed in the beauty of nature from the exquisite arrays of different plants to the insects, birds, small and large mammals uh, who made the backwoods their home seasonally, if not year round. At night, um, the star shows were incredible, the galaxies and stars setting the, the night aglow. And it was a great time to ponder um, the horrors, the beauties, the wonders, and the deep mysteries of a cosmos, uh, this cosmos that we call our home. It was a splendid time to reflect on the mysteries of existence also in the process of consuming itself uh, from herbivores, omnivores, and carnivores above and below ground to, on earth to stars and galaxies in the cosmos. You know, if you think about it, we live in a universe with some 200 to 300 million galaxies, each with billions of stars. It's hard for me to, to even start to wrap my mind around that. Um, at the center of each galaxy, we're told, is a black hole in the process of consuming the galaxy. So as I wrote Nourishment, all this was on my mind, and I used comparative food selection, nutrition, and help of er health of everything from insects to humans uh, simply as a way to reflect on the mysteries and wonders of existence in the process of consuming itself. That was what was driving what I did. Um, the first section of the book, Dining with Change, describes existence in an ever-changing universe. The next two sections of the book, <clears throat> Dancing with the Wisdom of the Body and Savoring the Artist's Palate, deal with food selection, nutrition, and health. The last two sections of the book, Grappling with Uncertainty and Fading into Mystery, focus on, on uncertainty, mystery, and wonder of a visit to this planet. So my point in writing the book wasn't to necessarily answer questions or be the big talking head or be dogmatic in any way, but to raise questions and to awaken a childlike awe and humility at the mysteries and wonders of a visit to Earth. Um, now, I've had a lot of people review the book and lots of things were written and so forth since <clears throat> in the last two years. But I think uh, one of my friends in Australia, uh, a writer named Matt Kaywood, really caught the essence of the book. And I I'd like to just read a, a few of his thoughts before we launch into this, because it, he really deals with some <clears throat> uncertainties I, I had in writing the book and, and since uh, it's come out. So he says, I know some people who have been a bit non-pulsed by, <clears throat> by nourishment, by its grafting of science and mysticism. But that is exactly what spoke to me. I've long been immersed in both worlds, recognizing the validity of each, but never really reconciling them into one worldview despite the work of others. I gave many, many talks in Australia and workshops over the last 30 years, and Matt participated in, in, uh, in many of those. He said, your talks began to put them together for me for the first time in a way that reflected my own experience. And nourishment brings the ideas from the talks together brilliantly and inspirationally. Some will feel aggrieved by this book. They will set out on an engaging scientific discussion <clears throat> on the interactions of minds, bodies, and diet, perhaps believing that this book is about, quote, diet, as it is cataloged by Google Books. And they'll find that the path leads not to a scientific certainties, but a joyous embrace of uncertainty. For these readers, nourishment will be like walking along a brush track, deeply engaged in conversation with their knowledgeable guide, 
in the expectation of being taken to a comfortable hotel at the day's end. But as night starts to fall and they start to take notice of their surroundings, they will find themselves in the middle of a vast wild mountain valley, no dwelling to be seen. The guide happily announces that this is the destination and he'll be off, thanks. Others, perhaps in the minority, will welcome the emptiness and find it welcoming. Like their guide, they might intuit that emptiness, offering no foothold for interpretations of the past or expectations of the future, is all possibility. In the end, you have the sense of Fred looking at himself, seeing a brief spark of improbable life set within the imponderable wheelings and unfoldings of galaxies, awestruck and grateful for the chance to be a particle of the universe observing itself. I think for me, Matt captured what the book was about uh, better than it, anyone has. And so it's, it's that kind of flavor I tried to build into this, con into this conversation today and what, what, I'll, what I'll present to you. And uh, the, the, so that's, that's the intent of it all. And uh, as I mentioned early on too, to, to make it a conversation. So there, there are several breaking, um, natural breaking points in as we go through the material. Let's just see how far we get. Here are the five sections that, that are in the presentation today. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, you can be free, and that means you and Susan and Steve also, to, to ask questions or to interject thoughts anywhere along the way. I very much like interaction as opposed to top, talking head. Um, but I'll, I'll naturally break at each of these sections too for, for comments, for questions, for discussion. So with that by way of background, is there anything, Steve, or you'd like to add, Susan, or just launch sure. in? Sure, let's start off with the kind of issue of uh, the kind of a holism of uh, looking at uh, the transcendent side of things like, for example, the, the each being being a part of the whole of the universe versus looking at the levels of self like the, you know, the brainstem and <clears throat> autonomic systems and then the, the emotional, motivational and all the way up through ego and transcendence within a person and that there's some kind of a integrity integrity involved in uh, integrating all those levels both as a person within oneself and as a person integrating into the into the world around us and um, I'm curious as to how you see the difference between humans with with you know we might say spiritual and and ego driven mechanisms that may not be part of other animal species <laughs> um, and how to how to recognize things like cravings as being potential addiction mechanisms versus for example a real communication from your subconscious mind or your or your um, autonomic nervous system that you really need something that you that you're craving Yes, good, good, good point to begin with. It made me when you were talking about, you know, the different facets of uh, of the universe and our connections. Made me think of Ar Ar Arthur Kostler's uh, notion of the holon and how you know holons within holons within holons from some atomic particles out to the universe and and all each of us is a part of that and. Uh, you know, I love that that idea. And as we go through the presentation, I'll really try to to make um, to make that come alive as part of as we go. I couldn't couldn't agree more with with what you were talking about there, Steve. You know, when it comes to um, observing other animals and how they behave, my wife and I have some chickens now. We, we, we've never, we've been around a lot of different wild domestic animals and worked with them, but never chickens. And it's just been a joy to each early morning and evening, we go out and we quote herd chickens. We turn them out of their coop and let them go. And 
just observing what other creatures do. We find it in these chaotic times, very calming and centering for us just to watch them be chickens and we've got two ducks with them. Um, so how animals behave and why they behave and then how they may or may not be similar to, to humans and what we do is I'm going to really dive into that as we get into these sections on dancing with the wisdom of the body and savoring the artist's palate and then grappling with uncertainty. I'm going to just, we'll really dive into those, to everything that you talked, that you raised there. So that's, you know, if the, that's where I want to go with this. I really do. And to me, um, you know, I don't know each person's background that's here today. Um, you know, how much you're interested in wild and domestic animals versus human beings. But what I tried to do in the book was to, to draw out, compare and contrast parallels and so forth between um, the animals that, that we studied for 40 years and human beings. So we'll really, you, you, your questions were just dead on to where I want to go as we go through this, you know? Go for it. Okay, um, so let's start out with dining with change and just a little background early on in, in my career uh, as an undergraduate, but especially as a graduate student, I was grappling with, you know, what's something that you can hold on to listening to all these professors talk about one thing or another in ecology and, and uh, you know, range science, which had to do with plant communities and domestic animals and grappling for what, what's something that you can hold on to. And I remember coming back from a, a meeting with two profs and I was sitting there in the pickup as we drove back and I was thinking, you know, really the only thing that you can hold on to is change. That's about the only thing that you can say anything about is change. So let me start with that. And, uh, you know, this idea that the only constant in life is change. The um, world is constantly changing, yet I think often we tend to think of change as anomalous, a sort of transitory disruption in a normally constant world. Um, even Albert Einstein was reluctant to accept change when he introduced what he called the cosmological constant into the general theory of relativity. What that amounted to was a refusal to accept change as the guiding principle structuring the evolution of the universe, this expanding universe. And it was, it was, as he later recounted, the greatest blunder he ever made in his career. On a more local scale here on Earth, floods, fires, hurricanes, tornadoes and droughts, which are becoming ever more prevalent huh, under changing climatic conditions. Um, when great volcanoes erupt, knocking down trees, covering the earth with a layer of volcanic ash for miles around, we think how strange it is that nature should misbehave so. It is, we tell ourselves, a momentary lapse, a kind of geological tantrum. Soon our old planet will regain its composure, its sameness. But the truth is, it's only our short tenure on earth that deludes us. Our time here is too short to see continents crash together and tear apart. Mountains rise and fall, vast oceans become deserts, climates warming and cooling endlessly, and plant and animal species coming and going like the ever-changing colors and shapes of a kaleidoscope. Change then isn't the exception to the rule, it's the only rule. Any individual, any social group, any species, if it is to survive, has got to be able to cope with change. So one can ask then, well, how well do we do? And I want to take a minute and just reflect on uh, companies, civilizations, and species um, to point out that, that nothing does last. Um, I was looking recently at lifetime of, of companies and the average life of an S&P 500 company has actually shrank over the last 50 years uh, pardon me, by over 50 years in the last century, from 67 years in the 20s to 15 years today. Small businesses, what I was looking at, said they typically last eight years, no more, before they either go extinct or morph into something else. Human civilizations have lifetimes too. You know, we often think of the Roman Empire lasting for a thousand years and uh, 
And some of the Chinese empires actually have lasted much longer. And Confucius, who I'll talk about if we get there later in the presentation, uh, was an, very instrumental in, in some of the length of the lifetimes of Chinese civilizations. But I read several books as I was preparing nourishment. And one of them, this short little book, Immoderate Greatness, Why Civilizations uh, Fail, by William Offless, I thought was very interesting. And he points out what he was doing in this book is simply summarizing many, many books that, that he had read on this topic. And he said, human civilizations typically last for 10 generations or roughly 250 years, and they evolve through five stages. And I'm not gonna take the time to, to try to give all the flavor of that, but I'll, I'll simply say that as I was reading his book and others, I was just struck by thinking about um, my short 70 years here on this planet and what has happened uh, in, in the United States and these different stages. And I thought about old people that I knew who were born at the turn of the century and what they used to talk about. And, and these stages came so alive to me from pioneers to commerce, to affluence, to this intellect stage. I think that all the time as I'm reviewing all these manu manuscripts for special issues of journals, quantity trumps quality. And not to be the big critic, but you know, there's so much that's being produced of papers, my goodness, we're buried in them. And I'm not sure that the quality, that there's hugely new things being contributed. But, and then the decadence, corrupt, unjust society. And I just couldn't help but think, We've gone through those stages as a country and we're, we're there. When I was reading him, we're in that last stage. Um, yep. And not to say that's good or bad, uh, it's, it is what it is. Go ahead. Did you... I was gonna say, it, 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 it cycles back again. And so for the next pioneering phase, the, the decadence age has to end. Right, exactly. And I think that's the way to, that, that I view these things anyway. It's, a, it's all a part of, of um, what we might call births and deaths or unending transformations. Huh? I think that's it. And What is so, the decadence of life? I'm sorry, I missed that. I stepped out. No, go ahead. It, what it, I, I, I just want to know what the decadence of life meant. I didn't oh, get the decadence that. part. Well, just, you know, think about all the corruption <laughs> What's happening in society nowadays, anyway? The lying, cheating, thieving, the just the, the kind of corruptness, the, the general corruptness that, that gets into a society, you know, where there's a lack of integrity. I don't know if you have that experience, but I could tell so many tales just here in the last couple of years. Um, I, I'll say, but just uh, that it seems like this integrity, this... When I was a young child, um, the old people there, there, there seemed to be such an integrity and your handshake was your word and there was no lying. There was, nowadays, my goodness, the ways people take one another for, I don't know, anyway, that, you know, it's that whole oh, thing. I'm the, experiencing the, that, yeah, a lot. The integrity part, yes, changes need to. Yes, yeah. no, well, that's, that's <laughs> what he's talking about, is just how society becomes so, lack of honesty and decency and integrity and respect for one another um yes you know, kinds of things that that's what he's talking about and uh okay i could relate to that yeah okay. let, me, let me provide another uh, potential example of that which would be for example personal consumption of goods and foods and and um pleasure and entertainment and things like that, that um, decadence would be getting sucked into all of that um, at the cost of your own life and, and health and welfare and those, that of the people around you. Hey Amen. That's, that's a really nice, nice way to say it. I'm tempted to give examples of uh, the things that are hap uh, happening in our life right now, but I'll, I'll let those go. I think we we're on the same page, that, that's it, you know? And of course, when you're reading a book, and this book can be read in a night or two, honestly, it's just so short and tight, but it comes alive and then you start reflecting in your own life and you think, oh my gosh, yes, I, 
I get all that. And then he goes on to talk about, we reach biophysical limits and now we can think, you know, ecologically with everything from pandemics to changing climates to, oh my gosh, what's happening with, with uh, you know, crashes of populations of species from insects and fishes to birds and mammals. So he talks about the limits that we reach ecologically, economically, our use of natural resources, socially, the kind of thing you just mentioned, Steve, re regard to one another, the haves and the have-nots. And, you know, and then there's another school of thought too that is ex emphasizes this idea of excessive complexity, that the levels of complexity become so great that they, we simply aren't able to deal with them. The human consciousness and mind and stuff, um, reaches a point where it can no longer really functionally deal with the excessive complexity and things become so polarized and paralyzed. And I often think about Washington DC and Congress and all that's going on. It's just the, the inability to, the complexity overwhelms the system. And so you have then this human error, practical failure, moral decay, and then you have the collapse. And then as you were pointing out, Steve, it's um, a rebirth. It's a rebirth. It's it's a rebirth, and so we experience we're experiencing that. And uh, you know, I think what I try to keep in mind is it, it's still it's amazing, like that old Chinese saying, "May you live in interesting times." Oh, boy, we're we're in them. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> but I try, and not that I always do it, but I try to think. You know, it's just such a blink that we're here and this experience. It's the experience of being alive. And it's, it's wonderful, you know, the horrors, beauties, wonders, deep mysteries of it all. And so participate in the, play the game, huh? Participate in the game. So that's some of the flavor of, of what he talks about. And one of the points he made that I, is so striking to me is this. He said, you know, historically, the consequences of a failed civilization were catastrophic for that particular local society and its inhabitants but they weren't fatal to homo sapiens as a species. And now, given that we are so interconnected, one with the next, and climate change to me is a perfect example. You know, what we all do matters to every one of us on the globe. And so the destinies of people worldwide are, are so linked now, ecologically, economically, and socially. We, and it seems the challenge to me anyway, and your thoughts, I'm welcome, but, you know, can, can we, can we pull together as a species? We're so tribal in our nature, you know, I want, can we pull together as a species um, to, to address some of the questions like, and, and to do that, and, you know, the answers to these questions are a mystery time will reveal, and however that goes, but it seems like that's the, that's the enormous challenge. And I, I want to end on that note. If we get there today, I really want to come back to this in that last stage, fading into mystery. It's really about these kind of issues. And uh, in a sense that you talked, Steve, to earlier in some of your broader, broader statements. So we'll come back to this. But these are questions that Aflis, um you know, really kind of comes to a, an end of his book on is, you know, uh, it's, these are the challenges. Are we up to it as a species? Can we transcend the boundaries that we create, which is really where I want to go. I see your head shaking a little bit. Um, I think some people will, but not everybody. But this is the kind of stuff that I'm really focusing on uh, myself. And I'm thinking about the young folks because a lot of them don't have the perspective that comes with age and, you know, accumulating a lot of information. And so, you know, I just really try and, and um, um, share information more with the young folks than anybody. Meryl, I think that's so important. I think that's something that we all, older folks can do, huh? And have an op I, I certainly have an opportunity every day. And it's one of the things I enjoy the most is being a cheerleader, helping in whatever way, whether that's writing proposals, writing papers. Um, my wife and I have had the opportunity here this summer to meet Yvonne and Melinda Chenard, founders of Patagonia. 
and if you know them and know their mission, you know, it's so much this way. And so they've come up here to Ennis, Montana, to visit with us a few weeks ago, and they were here just here yesterday afternoon. And so we're brainstorming about how, you know, all these kind of issues of the day. And, uh, and starting, I'm starting to work with some of the young folks at Patagonia related to, to issues that they're dealing with as part of the company. But it's such an opportunity for for us, and it's nice to feel that you're actually wanted at this point in the game too, right? That I mean, that you can that you can engage and be a cheerleader for younger people and uh, try to try to help in whatever way we can, right? Yes, and 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 also to you know when when you're older, theoretically, you have a better understanding of your own foibles so that you can then see more easily how we get sucked into things like um, blame or rationalization or other kinds of ways that we have for dealing with the world that make us feel comfortable but can lead us down a, a, um, a blind path. I, I think that's so true too, you know, and I always respected that as a young person in the older people that, that I was around, that little town that I talked about in nourishment, Salida. It really was um, like an extended family and the older people, I, I always really appreciated listening to them. Be, I don't know, somehow you just knew that they, that lifetime of experience that came to them through through living, not, not through books or anything else, through living was so valuable. And I see that in young people that I interact with now. They're so eager and they, they, they uh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to, to have those kind of transgenerational linkages, I think. Um, it's a wonderful thing. Okay, I'll keep, I love that the, this conversation, this is what I like, honestly. Let it roll. <laughs> I, I love this. So then we can go on from, so we started with businesses and how long do they last? Not so long. And then we went to civilizations and how long they typically last. And now we can talk too, and this I found very interesting as I went along in, uh, in my career to learn about the lifetimes of species that plants and animals as a species have lifetimes, uh, you know, from a few million to several million years. Obviously there's a wide range there, but you know that they don't last forever either. And I was amazed when I would read that, you know, 99% of the species that have been here on earth are now extinct. Um, throughout their lifetimes, they move about the planet as climates change. You know, in this discipline I was brought up in, and in ecology, I think, we tended back in the early days, and maybe now, to focus on, you know, well, how were things when, when European man came here to, to the country? As though they had always been that way and would always be that way. I, I really saw that. Um, but that, that view, I think, has changed. Here's a book, I, I, wonderful book by a Canadian um, ecologist, E.C. Pelou, um, long retired now, is After the Ice Age, Return of Life to Glaciated North America. It's a wonderful, wonderful account. If you think that species aren't dynamic and that they aren't moving around the globe, plant and animal species both, read that book and you just, she makes it come alive, how the glaciers were covering, you know, it's only been the last, up to 20,000 years ago, had incredible glaciations. The glaciers have, we're in an interglacial now. Glaciers have, have melted. But, um, you know, in theory, longer term, we'll go back into a glaciation. Regardless, though, you get this sense of the dynamism, the dynamism of species moving about the planet. And I used to think, you know, <clears throat> in the disciplines I was in, we interpret snapshots of times past as, quote, the way things always were and always should be. There was this attempt to, you know, well, what was the vegetation growing? At? This is along the Green River in Wyoming. What was the vegetation that was there prior to European settlement? That's what should always be there. And it misses this dynamic that, that it's just a snapshot um, of moving target. And I used to tease my colleagues 
I'd say, well, if we've been here when species now that we consider to be native were invading, what would we have done? And they'd get a grin on their face because, well, we'd have tried to get rid of them, wouldn't we? That's what we do. We try to get, it's not native. Um, yeah, there's I, a great example of the earthworm moving north into various uh, forests in, uh, I think it's, I uh, um, can't remember if it's Canada or New England, where certain native forests are failing because the earthworms have now reached that area and are changing the ecology of the soil. No, that I know of that, Deucey, that's absolutely the case, and that's a part of the world, you're right. You know, and if you want to think of invasive species, human beings are the most invasive species on the planet, if you want to get right there. I mean, we've, and again, none of this is critique. It's, it's to me, it's try to reflect. I mean, we've moved all over the place from Africa. We, we really, so yesterday's invasive species are tomorrow's new natives, are today's new natives and tomorrow's relics. Again, this idea of dynamism, you know, of the movement uh, of, of things. And that's not to say, and I'll get into this as we go on, that we don't want to try to manage in ways that that are healthy for creatures below ground, above ground, and the whole system. And I'm not saying that, but just this idea of dynamism is, I think, so central. So I used to say then things never were the way they were and they, they never will be again. I'm one that, that really buys into this idea, not of a deterministic universe, um, Einstein's view that if we, and others, that if we understood all the parts and all the interactions, we'd be able to predict everything that's going to happen to everything throughout life. I, I'm much more of a quantum kind of guy, and that uncertainty and that, and then that enables creativity in terms of relationships. So I think, to me, endless creativity in the physical universe is a will, is a real but it comes at a cost. The price of admission is endless transformation. So this idea that you've been saying nicely, Steve, and you know, from death comes life and, and endless transformation. And that's, you know, that's in the physical world, but it's in the mytho mythologies to the Eastern mythology. So, so much that. So, you know, this, this idea here, um, I was reading an article recently about constants in physics, you know, some things, <clears throat> these change occurs, but underneath it, there's a constancy. And energy and matter are one, you know, energy and matter uh, and ceaselessly changing forms one to the next, as, you know, Einstein taught us back when equals mc squared. So solar energy arrives on earth and becomes matter in the form of green leaves, creating the food we eat and uses fuel for our thought. Uh, what is this mind of ours? What are these atoms with consciousness? asked the late Richard Feynman, last week's potatoes, huh? It's that connectedness again, huh? And to me, we'll go, as we go later, I see everything as conscious. I really, I feel that that's really, that I've written some papers since we spoke, Susan, about, about different issues related, related to that and plant consciousness. But so now to kind of bring this to, this part of introduction to, to an, um, in the in the Tao, say if you realize that all things change, there is nothing you will try to hold on to. If you aren't afraid of dying, there is nothing you can't achieve. Um, I think of Yvonne Chenard and the, our conversations yesterday. You know, he pioneered. I didn't know a lot of this. I'm learning more about Patagonia and and Yvonne, but he pioneered many many climbing techniques. Um, Back in the day, he, he's, he's famous for some of the climbing techniques. And in Yosemite, uh, El Capitan, they were some of the first people that had to develop whole ways uh, from blacksmith things to, but he talks about being on the edge and that climbing and that, you know, his fear of death went away because he was so close to death so many times. He was not afraid anymore. And he's not afraid now at 82, you know, it's, and we talked about transformation and the, you know, yesterday as, uh, and some of our mutual friends like the Craigheads, uh, if you're a wildlife biologist, you know of the Craigheads and their work in, in Yellowstone National Park with grizzly bears and so many different things that they did back in the 50s and 60s. And uh, he's talking about these Craighead brothers are identical 
twins, John and Frank, they're both dead now, but he said Frank uh, ended up with Alzheimer's where John did not. And he was talking about the last time he saw Frank, he took him fishing and he put him on his back and carried him to a hole where he liked to fish. He had Parkinson's and could hardly, hardly go. And he was talking about transformation, transformation. Trying to control the future is like trying to take the master carpenter's place. When you handle the master carpenter's tools, chances are that you'll cut yourself. Now that's in there because when we go later on in the conversation, I see this movement in what's we talked about so much yesterday with Yvonne and Melinda of regenerative ag um, as a movement away from this industrial mindset back to trying to understand the processes of nature. How does nature work and how can we come to work with nature? And I think this so much. We've tried to take the master carpenter's tools into our hands and we're bleeding everywhere right now would be a view I would say. And at least in the regenerative ag and some of the movements now, there's, there's very much this trying to understand the processes of nature and how can we work with them? How can, you know, that we're members of nature's communities, what we do to them, we do to ourselves, that kind of, of view. So that, that little quote's in there because I want to come back and really talk about some of those ideas and what, what people are doing. And it, probably you're all familiar with that, but I think it'd be really good for us to, to come back, come back to that. Um, I often think we resist change by declaring wars and fighting battles against anything that threatens the constancy under the guise of saving the world. And again, I'm not being the big critique or blaming, but we, you know, we declare war on everything, right? The war on climate, the war on, the war to end all wars, uh, invasive species, the wars on that. And, and now and, we're uh, declaring a war on humanity itself <laughs> because um, humans, by their tendency to want to blame other people, even blame themselves, now consider most of the ecological change that may be, in fact, the, uh, pre the prequel to the next ice age, which should be happening right now, um, based on our scientific evidence, that because we are blaming that on mankind, instead of on a natural cycle of life, um, we may end up doing massive damage where if we were just accepting, we it wouldn't happen that way. Yes, I'm on the same page as you with what you're saying, Steve, absolutely. So, you know, to me, the, this kind of, of background, I think is so valuable just to, to reflect, to reflect as, as we're reflecting and as, as you're reflecting on, on all of these things. I think to declare war, and you just said it, Steve, we focus myopically on an en enemy, in ignoring the interdependent and ever-changing nature of reality, right? I think you, you captured that. And I often think there really is nothing to save, just the self grasping for power, control, and permanence in a universe of impermanence. Huh? So just well, yeah, but we have to, you know, acknowledge on some level that emergent phenomena are just as much of a reality as the second law of thermodynamics, which suggests that things are going to decay into chaos, and yet, you know, we have all this emerging phenomena happening where. You know, we have life and then we have feedback systems and then we have consciousness. And so all of these things that emerge are intrinsically unpredictable from the perspective of the previous level. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's the beauty of the whole thing, right? So it keeps life interesting. Do you ever see that movie Pleasant, Bill? Yes. Yeah, that was the whole point in there, right? That that's absolutely it, and that that's what keeps the whole thing uh, challenging and opportunity, you know, challenges and opportunities and so forth. It's it's a wonderful, wonderful opera in that sense, right? We never know what's the next. <laughs> absolutely, and that's where I got so interested as we went along in in my career on self-organizing systems and and emergent properties, it just seemed like that's so what we're seeing, huh? what, what, what it is, and the inability to, to, to predict, as you said. So it's also an issue, though, of a personal growth that 
as we get older and see more wisdom, that there's an emergent phenomena that's just associated with, with wisdom in a human. I, I think, I think that's true. And I think this is another topic I'd like to, if we have the time to talk about. Uh, I so agree with you. And I think uh, the trials that we face in life transform us. Uh, at least that was my experience. Some of the, you know, from the, in my case, from depression to cancer to letting go of things, I never looked at the world the same way after that. And I think that's part of that aging that you talk, right? If you're around long enough, our daughter right now, uh, she's really undergoing one of these. <laughs> I was tempted to mention something earlier with the, the lack of, <clears throat> of decency, the, the way people treat one another and some of what's happened to her recently. But, you know, with the shutdown in LA and everything, she's lost her work, she's lost where she lived and she is undergoing a huge transformation and it's very challenging for her, but I think in the end, and I try to be nice in talking with, she's gonna be a different person and, and she's gonna come a, alive in a way that, that's like you're trying to say, Steve, I'm not certain what's a good word to say for that. You know, I, I just, for me, I never looked at the world the same way it, after all those, uh, after the trials, and I think that's, Part yeah. of the life. I really want to come back to that. That's in that last section of this and talk about some of those those ideas that you're raising. I see a lot of that in people, for example, who have recovered from addictions, where they pull themselves, you know, they end up face down in the gutter um, and they pull themselves out and it transforms their lives. And they look back at that and say, that was one of the best things that could have happened to me. Amen to that. Boy, and that's that's exactly what I've said so many times on those things, but it's nothing you'd volunteer for, right? I mean, you know, not when it's sign, happening. <laughs> sign me up for that one. That sounds like a good time. It's we'll come back to that for sure. You know, we'll come if we have the time. That's something I, I find so interesting. What the points that you're raising. So you know old ideas, all compounded things are impermanent, like a star, an optical illusion, or a flame, a magical illusion, a dewdrop, or a bubble. Like a dream, a flash of lightning, or a cloud, so should one consider all compounded things. My father lived to be 95 years old, and I can relate more and more to some of the things he used to say in his last years. He'd sometimes get reminiscing about when we kids were younger, and he say, it's, it's like I dreamed it. It's not like it was ever real. It's like it was a dream. And I, I think that a lot anymore too. It's, it was, it's like it was a dream, a wonderful dream. <laughs> but um, even the hard times, I think you look back, I do anyway and think, you know, that was just, that's amazing to have, to be here. And I feel that about what all that's happening now. Um, you know, just this is the experience of being alive, huh? the experience of being alive. So this will end this. Uh, I used to ponder when I, we were there in the backwoods looking at the night sky, you know, I am without beginning or end, really unfathomable. I, as a young child, I used to lay in bed at night and think, you know, what would nothing be? If nothing were, what would nothing be? How is, you know, I mean, these imponderables, right? At least to do this mind them. But I can neither be created nor destroyed. I change form endlessly. A life, a civilization, a species, a universe, ever-changing verses in the language of I am, origins of I am beyond all categories of, of thought. Um, so here's where we are, huh? <laughs> and it's wonderful. Let me take a minute now and just so against this background of change then and it'll move us toward um, some of the topics that that uh, I think people are interested in in talking about related to comparative food selection nutrition and health in these next sections um, so creatures are challenged to transform them as environments change uh, populations uh, species have got to to transform 
and of course Darwin came up with amazing theory related to to plants and animal all life on this planet um, species changes genes with survival value are passed to the next generation and certainly that's as valid today as as it was when he talked about that these ideas in my mind anyway of selection of natural selection I think though in my education on evolution and uh, at least in the early days it tended to take a kind of a rigid view and I want to I want to put ideas out that that are far I think more in sync with with the way things are looked at now not such a rigid a rigid view of things um, and I want to make a point all the way through this that <clears throat> organisms aren't just genes animals aren't machines and genes aren't destiny organisms are and this includes plants as well they're creating relationships with what they deem are the relevant facets of the social and biophysical worlds that they inhabit to me that's been one of the most amazing things and i added a couple of more slides susan as i went along to just try to give examples of that when you watch when we watch these chickens and i won't bore you with the examples now but how they learn about their environment and how they innovate in that environment it's amazing if you just follow them around and watch a little bit what they do you realize they're not machines they're figuring things out and it's unique to the environment and so a chicken right here in our little place is going to be different from a chicken down the road is different from another one and same for all of these creatures um, i want to show you a little um, video that makes a point about about these kind of relationships this is an oyster catcher by the way <laughs> You may or may not have had an idea where that was going to end with that oyster catcher, but it's these kind of things that I think are so fascinating about animals of how they create relationships with the environments that they inhabit. And so how did that oyster catcher figure out to use a piece of bread to fish? Um, those are the kind of things that I watched animals do over the years and just exactly how that transpires I'm, I'm not sure on the cases I've, I've watched, but I'm gonna give you examples as we go along and how that became functionally significant for those animals and their populations to be able to survive. And then that becomes a part of the culture of the creatures. It's a cultural part of things and that's not written into their DNA that they would do those kind of things necessarily. So, you know, we, we say nature of horrors of vacuum. I think um, what nature of horrors is <clears throat> sameness. Nature fills vacuums with individuals and no two are alike. It's amazing to think about what I just said to me. No two individuals in a species have ever been alike on this planet. No two alike. Why is that? Well, in this book, The Triple Helix, Lewontin really, it's a short book, Gene, Organism, and Environment. But he makes the point about, you know, you've got genes as a part of, of what's going on. And they're, as we know, interacting with environments to create organisms. But then he adds what he can calls noisy development and gives such wonderful examples of how that takes place at a molecular level. Noisy development is what quantum physicists talk about as chance. 
the role of chance in the development of organisms in the womb early in their developmental processes. And uh, so you have not only genes plus environment, you have genes plus environment plus chance. So as I pointed out in the book, if, you, if a creature was conceived under identical conditions of genes and environment, over and over again, they still wouldn't be born the same creature because chance is playing a role at the molecular level, just as it is in quantum. And that's a creativity that's in those systems. And it, it means, and I, I didn't put in a bunch of slides of this, but <clears throat> during the last 20 years of my career, we made a point with every paper we wrote to point out the amount of variation among individuals in the studies that we had. Um, <clears throat> you know, in science, you're looking for means and, and are the means of one population different from another in your study. And that tends to make things look more uniform than they really are. When you look at the range of variability, you, it comes over and over again how no two of these creatures are alike, you know? And in his book, <clears throat> Biochemical Individuality, Roger Williams, and they published the first draft of this in the mid 50s, years ago. It says, the key to understanding what shapes your health, the basis for the genotropic concept. And it's just <clears throat> a timeless classic that links the diversity in our anatomy and body chemistry to our unique nutritional needs. And over and over and over again, he talks about how <clears throat> uniqueness in morphology and physiology and how that leads to uniqueness in behavior. Um, you know, we know that each of us, one of us is so unique, we can be identified by our fingerprint, a bloodhound can track us by our odors. And as he points out, if we were to look inside of our bodies, we would see <clears throat> how absolutely different we are in terms of our form and function. I'll talk a bit more about that as, as I go along with some of the material today, just in some of the studies we did and showing how the environment where, where an individual was raised really changes <coughs> form and function and behavior of individual. And then beyond that, as we're, we're saying, this whole role that chance can play in that. Um, so I think so revealing. And then you start to think about we make recommendations for nutrition and health based upon the, the average individual, right? But there is no such thing as an average individual. Everyone is unique. Going back to a point that you made that will come too strongly, Steve, that means then trying to tie into the wisdom of one's own body um, becomes very, very Im important because each one of us is unique and recognizing that uniqueness and then try, how do you, as you raise those questions, so relevant questions, how do you figure out who you even are and, and work from that? Uh, again, I want to come back to that. I sound like I'm putting everything off, but, but I, just kind of looking ahead to where I'd like to go with, with these kind of ideas. This whole field of epigenetics, I think it is so timely and so related then <clears throat> to what we're talking about. If you <clears throat> don't know about epigenetics, it's really heritable changes in gene expression, <clears throat> excuse me, caused by mechanisms other than changes in the DNA sequence. <clears throat> so what we're talking about is that genes are being expressed as a function of the interaction with the environment. <clears throat> and as those interactions change, which genes are expressed, the degree to which they're expressed, all that becomes unique to the individual in their environment. Um, if, if a person isn't familiar with this area of epigenetics, there's a wonderful NOVA special that was produced oh, over 10 years ago now titled Ghost in Your Genes. It's just a marvelous, marvelous, um, <clears throat> as Nova specials typically are, a marvelous 50-some minute description of what epigenetics is with, with marvelous, marvelous examples. It, it just, it'll ground you so well in what that is. And it's, it's a hugely important and um, 
area in plant and animal research nowadays, this idea of genes being expressed. You know, so genes really aren't destiny in that sense. Genes are being expressed as a function of this temporal and spatial dynamics in these environments and, uh, and it better enabling animals to, to be able to survive in the environments that they're inhabiting. I'll, I'll give examples of this as we go along from the standpoint of food selection. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of like, a play on Arthur Kessler's uh, The Ghost in the Machine too, um, the, 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 the series. But um, I can also provide an example of how genetics and epigenetics plays out in terms of brain development. At some point in um, prenatal brain, brain development, there's a way in which neurons broadcast across the brain. And the neurons will send out these dendrites and axons that'll grow across the brain. And then that's somewhat chaotic. Each time a neuron is growing across the brain, it has a chance to go you know, below a, another cell and change direction. It's always, there's a lot of chaos involved. And so this massive of, of, of unpredictability happens. And then at a later stage of development, those broadcast neurons are pruned based on whether or not they connected properly or not. And that, that pruning process takes place in humans after birth instead of before birth as it is in all other animal species. And in children with Down syndrome, the ability of that pruning process to be directed goes awry because there's too much hydrogen peroxide in the brains of children with Down syndrome. And the ability of the brain to resist over pruning depends upon iron and, and selenium status and your selenium stats depends on where in the country you're, you're born. Yeah, that's a fabulous, fabulous example that pulls together many, many of the <clears throat> general ideas that we've been talking about, including the chaotic nature of that, huh? and then the pruning as a function of the environment and the <clears throat> role nutrition plays, perfect kind of, of example of that. <clears throat> Other comments or questions fo folks would like to add? Feel free as, uh, as anything occurs to you, we're uh, more, than, more than open. And as we said, we'll, we'll go however it goes. And, uh, but for me to have this kind of interaction is, is so much more rewarding than just to be sitting here, here talking. So to conclude this part, I think we should take our views of evolution beyond how organisms develop from earlier forms to include changes occurring within the lifetimes of the individuals. Individuals are involved in the world, which allows them to evolve with the world. It's, the, it's relationships, about relationships and creativity in, in that sense. So that's, that's the First, that's the background section then, just a little bit of ideas on dining with change and, and some thoughts on that. Um, where I'd like to go next is <clears throat> to, to deal with both of these topics, dancing with the wisdom of the body and savoring the artist's palate. Um, before we do, are there any other thoughts that people would like to add on the dining with change section? I don't want to belabor it, but if, if people would like to add any thoughts, now's the time. We'll build on that section as we go all the way through here. And really, uh, the comments and, uh, and discussion so far have, have set up these other stages in many ways um, that you'll see as we go on. We don't have any accumulated questions. And okay. nobody's raising their hand. So let me suggest that you go on. Okay, perfect.